Okay, I'm going live in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the IINA webinar this afternoon. And uh, we are very pleased uh, to be joined today by Madame Nathalie Noiseau, who is a member of the European Parliament and chair of the Subcommittee on Security and Defence, who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule uh, to join us this afternoon. Uh, Madame Loiseau will speak for about 20 minutes and then we will go to questions and answers with our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. And uh, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once um, Madame Loiseau has finished her presentation. Uh, we would appreciate if you could give your name and affiliation when you're putting forward your questions. And just a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free, uh, of course, to join the discussion on Twitter and using the handle at IIEA. So now may I formally introduce um, Madame Nathalie Loiseau, MEP. Um, she is currently serving as a member of the European Parliament, and uh, she is the appointed chair of the Subcommittee on Security and Defence, and is also a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. And prior to joining the European Parliament, Madame Oiseau led the resistance list, a campaign initiative of French President uh, Macron during the 2019 elections, European elections. And previously, uh, Nathalie Loiseau served as Minister for European Affairs in the French government from 2017 to 2019, in the course of which she visited Ireland. And prior to this, she was Dean of the École Nationale d'Administration, uh, ENA, and for five years, and a diplomat within the French Foreign Ministry. So, the world has seen two major political events in the past three months, change of president in the United States and the final act of the Brexit decision of 2016. So in her address, reconfiguring security and defense post Trump and post Brexit, uh, we will hear a very timely uh, assessment uh, of these events. And uh, Madame Oiseau, we look forward to your address. Um, with considerable anticipation and the, the virtual floor is yours. You're most welcome. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, IIEA and, and you personally for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be with you virtually, even if I would have preferred to come back to Ireland, a country which is dear to my heart. Um, I will immediately start um, in order to give time for questions and answers um, after uh, my introductory remarks. Um, I would like to start by mentioning uh, that in Europe, we pride ourselves for an, an impressive achievement. Uh, we are in peace in the European Union for a number of decades and we are proud about it. But is it really peace? And this is what I would like to question to begin with. Uh, just to mention our neighborhoods, all of them have become unstable. Uh, we do remember uh, that since 2014, we know uh, because of the annexation of Crimea by Russia, uh, that our Eastern partnership uh, is fragile. Uh, it faces threats which all concern us. And recently uh, we saw uh, frozen conflicts uh, experiencing global warming, if I may say so, including in Nagorno-Karabakh last year. Uh, Western Balkans, they are in the heart of Europe and a number of disputes are still unsettled between Serbia and Kosovo, uh, inside Bosnia-Herzegovina, or even, even between two members of the EU, Croatia and Slovenia, there are still territorial disputes which are not really settled. Uh, if we look south, uh, Syria, uh, it's a sad anniversary. Uh, the uh, demonstration started 10 years ago and repression immediately after. 
And we were not able, we in the EU, to participate decisively in a political settlement. Although there are consequences for Europe, be them uh, the uh, number of refugees coming from uh, Syria, but also um, terrorist attacks which have been plotted in Syria. Libya is another conflict. Next to our shores, uh, which is still ongoing, uh, with absence of state and presence of foreign actors, Russia and Turkey in particular. And this is a pattern that we see elsewhere. I should mention the Middle East peace process, whether it's really a process and whether it leads towards peace is now questionable. And further down south, Sahel uh, is a challenge uh, for all the European countries and Ireland knows it quite well because there are have been for quite a long time Irish troops in CSDP missions. So our neighborhoods are fragile. Multilateralism is a principle in which we strongly believe and it has been more and more threatened in recent years. You see the United Nations Security Council very often um, blocked by vetoes. You see international organization, WTO, WHO, UNESCO, where uh, an American withdrawal uh, leaves more room to non-democratic actors. It's not only that the US is not present, it's that others have more weight. Um, I would also mention the international arms control architecture, which is shaken. Uh, the INF treaty uh, is no longer in place. Open skies uh, is in shambles. We don't know what will take place with New START, uh, and we are, of course, very concerned by the uh, status of GCPOA with, with Iran. Uh, we, all, we are also facing less conventional warfare, and on this, we are not uh, in peace. Hybrid threats do target European uh, countries. Cyber attacks are numerous, and we saw plenty of them uh, since the pandemic started. The same for disinformation, which has, which has never been that um, harsh towards uh, European countries and the European Union itself. And of course, terrorism, I speak from a country which was uh, hit several times by terrorist attacks. So the notion of borders uh, is less and less relevant and we have to rethink our security or defense and how we get organized. We also know that some countries have become more and more assertive uh, if not aggressive. It has been the case of Russia for quite a long time, um, and Russia is not cooperating with the West. It's more and more the case with China, distancing itself from a more traditional foreign policy of non-aggression and looking inward. More and more you have an assertive China. You see what's taking place in Hong Kong. You see uh, the number of threats towards Taiwan or assertiveness in South China Sea uh, are concerns. You see Turkey uh, closer to our borders, uh, whose behavior has changed quite a lot and not in a positive manner. For a number of years, Turkey was the country without foes. To nowadays, Turkey is more and more a country without friends, uh, having an aggressive approach towards um, uh, Syria, towards Libya, toward Eastern Mediterranean, Greece and Cyprus, and uh, taking part in a conflict like Nagorno-Karabakh and being more and more present in Lebanon. And you see a NATO uh, member buying Russian military equipment. This is quite new uh, pattern of behaviors. Russia, China, Turkey, what they have in common uh, is that they might be rivals, they might be competitors, uh, they might not agree on everything, but they seem to be agreeing on one thing, joining forces to weaken the West. Um, so this is also new to our uh, security environment. All of this has been accelerated by the erratic foreign policy of Donald Trump. Uh, what he called uh, America first or Mer make America great again turned into America alone and made the bad guys strong again. Uh, we are facing more assertiveness from rogue states or countries which don't 
be, behave the way they used to behave uh, previously. There's, there is a huge loss of leadership from the United States on the global stage. So how easily will it, will it be overturned by a Biden administration remains to be seen. There are reasons for optimism. Uh, we have heard what Joe Biden said already uh, about his trust in multilateral, multilateralism, his willingness to go back to the Paris Agreement, to go back to the uh, World Health Organization, uh, his willingness to lead by example, uh, to go back to DCPOA and to lead an alliance of democracies. All this is positive and we should support uh, this trend. But we don't know yet whether we will see a Biden administration or if I was a little bit provocative, an Obama three administration. When you look at the uh, appointments being made, very competent, very brilliant people, they were all in place during the Obama administration where already this notion of non-intervention in global affairs, of pivoting towards Asia, of less uh, commitment to Europe uh, or to European security was already in place. That might still be something to discuss quite soon with the US administration. Uh, there are many reasons to believe that this American administration will be inward looking. Uh, trying to heal the wounds of a divided nation. And what took place in the capital two weeks ago cannot be underestimated, uh, and rightly so. And then you also have to ask yourself whether uh, the Democrat uh, in Washington uh, want uh, an alliance between equal partners, between Europe and US, or simply ask the Europeans to align with American positions. Uh, and our priorities, our objectives might differ with the United States. They might not contradict, but they might differ in terms of what is really a security priority for the EU compared to what is really a security priority for the US. Uh, in the middle of all this came Brexit. Um, and Brexit uh, in foreign policy, first of all, we have to admit that um, as regard the participation of the UK into CSDP, there is, the loss is, is small. CSDP was never something that uh, the UK uh, really um, uh, owned and really valued that much. There were few um, staff or military from the United Kingdom in CSDP missions. There were reluctance uh, towards efforts like European Defense Fund or PESCO, I'm pretty certain that we have made progress on European defense because the UK was leaving the European Union. Uh, but there is a lot that remains to be done because uh, the UK is a key partner in terms of defense, in terms of foreign policy, and we have to find ways to work together. I, I am really disappointed that the British government was not interested in having foreign, foreign policy and uh, defense included in the partnership agreement, which was concluded on December 24th. Uh, they had agreed in the political declaration in 2019, but then they, were, they, they, they went back and they said that they were not interested. And to my view, um, this is something that has to be complemented uh, the sooner the better. Because when we work in the European Union on sanctions, on, or when the UK works on sanctions toward a third state, we should work together. We should harmonize uh, our decisions. Uh, we should keep on discussing in the UN Security Council about our positions. And I remember vividly um, when I was in the government, it was the moment where there was the Salisbury incident, chemical attack against two uh, people uh, in the United Kingdom. And the unity of the European Union, where the UK was still a member state at the time, was impressive and probably uh, impressive enough, enough for Moscow uh, to convince the Russian government 
to exercise restraint. So we have to get back this capability to work together, to exchange intelligence, or to decide uh, to uh, send troops together in the future. And I do hope that the British government would change its mind. But in this context, what should the EU do? Uh, there have been dozens of seminars and discussions about strategic autonomy. And I would like to go back to it for a moment. What, that, what does it mean, strategic autonomy? It doesn't mean that we are turning our back uh, from traditional allies. It means that we work in a framework of alliances when we can, but that we also act autonomously when we have to, when there is something that needs to be uh, fixed and partners or allies are not interested. Uh, let's take a look at NATO. Not all member states are members of NATO and speaking to an Irish audience, it seems obvious, uh, but you have to remind it to other member states which are members of NATO. I was mentioning the issue with Turkey. Uh, when you have a country like Turkey member of NATO, it means that for the time being, until the Turkish authorities go back to a more friendly behavior, there are things that will not be dealt with within NATO because there is a problem of trust and of uh, diverging uh, interests and priorities. Uh, very often the EU has wider competences than, than NATO to face hybrid threats. You not need to have competences on health, on logistics, on cyber, things that are not always um, comprehensive when you talk about a military alliance like NATO. Or when you work in Sahel, you have to have a continuum between um, development assistance, uh, support civilian missions, and military missions. This is something that the EU is able to do, not NATO. Um, and if you look at NATO uh, by itself, commitments by member states in terms of defense spending and equipment have not been met yet. So the, the magical word or the magical one is not NATO. Uh, European defense efforts are not against NATO. They are a complement and um, they are also an acknowledgement. With COVID, we know better than before the price of dependency, not only at a military or purely security level, but we saw that being dependent on uh, uh, medical equipment from third states was a weakness. Uh, we know by experience that the EU has to focus on its sovereignty. Uh, and we know that the definition of strategic autonomy is wider than only security and military. And uh, the good news is that we have started enhancing our efforts towards uh, European defense. We have started with CARD, a way to coordinate our efforts uh, in terms of capabilities to know more what others are doing, where are the loopholes, where are the redundancies, and where efforts should be made. Then we have PESCO, uh, commitments made by member states to work together uh, on uh, enhancing capabilities, on making uh, operational um, interoperability uh, a reality. You have 25 member states, member of PASCO. That's a lot. Uh, that's very inclusive. Maybe this is, doesn't help making it very ambitious, but we are, we have to learn by doing. And then we have, since the beginning of this year, the European Defence Fund. For the first time, there is money coming from the European budget dedicated to support efforts uh, among member states to finance research and development for military capabilities. So all of this uh, makes it a toolbox. We have a toolbox in front of us, that's good news. And a toolbox is fine, but it's not enough if there is not common will, and this is political will. So we have to work to make sure that we see the world uh, in a shared manner. 
It has started last year with what was called the strategic compass. And uh, the results of these efforts should uh, be uh, evaluated in 2022. It started by a shared assessment of threats coming from uh, intelligence services from all over the European Union, bringing together in the same basket what they know about the outside world, how they see it, uh, what sort of information they have. Uh, and what is very interesting is that it was not um, agreed by the uh, heads of state and government. It was simply put together in order for people to know um, how the world looks like seen from Dublin or seen from Tallinn or seen from Lisboa or seen from Ljubljana. And it brings us more knowledge, more common strategic culture, which should make things easier in the future in order to take decisions. Because we've talked to talk, but now it's time that we walk the walk. And we already see the results of these efforts. When you see that there are French troops in the Baltic states, in Lithuania, in Estonia, um, under NATO command, uh, in an effort uh, to face a Russian threat, believe me, that was not a natural trend of French military to begin with. Uh, they were not used to be uh, present in this part of Europe. They didn't know uh, uh, that much of the current level of Russian threat. Now that they are sent there, uh, they express a lot of interest of, about what they are learning, the experience they are making, and vice versa. When you see that there are Estonian troops in Mali, or Czech troops, or Swedish troops under French command in Barkhane, um, Sahel was not immediately on the radar of public opinion in these countries. But now there is this common uh, uh, acknowledgement that a terrorist threat, threat or failed states uh, in Africa are a concern for all European uh, countries. So this is working progress. This will in obviously remain complex. We are talking about competences which belong to governments. Uh, they are national competences and governments are jealous to keep their competences. We know the rule of unanimity for foreign policy and defense decisions in the council, which sometimes prevented us uh, from being speedy enough or sometimes is used by third states to try to divide and, and slow down the processes in the European Union. And it happens, we have to ad agree with it, we have to admit it. There are specificities, specificities uh, within the Union, uh, neutral states, uh, NATO states, um, we have to take it, it into consideration and that everyone feels uh, comfortable with the way we are making decisions and implementing decisions. So there are opt-outs, uh, there are constructive abstentions, as we have just did with European Peace Facility. Um, the uh, presence of troops on the ground in CSDP missions is only made on a voluntarily basis, which allows for the EU to have a foreign policy and, and a defense policy. Whether it's enough is debatable, but for the time being, um, it makes things easier for a number of member states and we have to value it. We shouldn't be afraid of using different formats. Uh, we should not be too French. French li like um, uh, very classical patterns where everybody is involved and everybody abides by the same rules. In defense and security issues, this is not the most operational way of doing things. This is why there was uh, for several years this European intervention initiative, uh, which was put forward by France actually saying to countries, if you are interested, if you are able and willing, we can join forces. We can meet more often than not. We can exchange experiences. We can exchange information. We can uh, exercise together so that we know each other better, so that we are trained together uh, in order to be able, if need be, to act together uh, smoothly without uh, discovering who are the others uh, and what are their 
habits uh, on the ground. And it had provided with the possibility, for instance, to have European special forces in Sahel working together uh, in very demanding environment because they, they trusted each other, because they get used to each other uh, and they are able to act. But then again, we have to include the UK. And this was the uh, idea of the uh, European Intervention Initiative from, the, from day one to say to the United Kingdom, you are welcome. It's not because you're not a member of the European Union that you cannot participate. It's the same with Norway. It's the same with other countries which have uh, common threats, common challenges, uh, a comparable uh, strategic culture and with which we have to continue to work together. Um, we have to explain it to American friends we did it and we, we, we managed it with the Trump administration. I, I remember having been in, in a mission to Washington explaining the European Defense Fund to a super reluctant Trump administration. At the end of the day, we made it. So it will, of course, be easier with uh, a Biden administration. But let's always remember that America has its priorities, which might not always be ours. And we should not blame the Americans for what they do or what they don't. We should uh, uh, think of what we do and what we don't do. And we have to be relevant partners of the United States. Uh, to this extent, I do view Ireland as a very important bridge, a bridge with the United Kingdom and a bridge with the United States, because you are valued partners of both and a strong member of the European Union. So I do look forward to more cooperation with Ireland on all these uh, topics, because I think it's really a priority for us in the present and in the near future.